a longitude prize judge. Uh, I'm based here at the Edinburgh University um, and I will be moderating today's seminar. So I'm calling from sunny Scotland, um, so that's the light coming from the side. Apologies for that. So um, if it looks a little bit weird. So um, we will have a, a very nice seminar today um, and uh, a few slides to go through. Um, could you change the slide, please, for the agenda? Okay, so um, we will have, um, so you see the agenda, I hope, um, for the webinar. And uh, the most um, important today is uh, that we will hear from three um, teams from the Longitude Prize, co competing teams um, in the uh, Longitude Prize competition, um, which I, I'm, I'm really happy to, to have them on board today. And um, I'm also very happy, really, that the, uh, we could uh, uh, get some time um, from uh, an expert, uh, really, in the field, and, uh, important in the moment, um, who is uh, from the Medical Health Regulations Agency, MHRA, um, who is uh, uh, especially involved now with the COVID-19 tests and the clinical validation. So, Stephen Lee, uh, I'm really happy that uh, you were able to join us. Um, I'm sure you're very, very busy at the moment. Um, so we will have these presentations um, and, um, and then at the end we will have a question and answer session uh, for about 20 minutes. Um, we will be uh, receiving or we would like to ask you to put in uh, your questions in the chat function in Zoom. I'm sure uh, you all by now are very familiar with Zoom um, and the chat function. And, um, Please do so during the talks. Um, uh, if you have a, a specific question for a, a speaker you want to have answered directly after a presentation, please indicate that. Otherwise, uh, we address them in the Q&A session at the end in order not to interrupt the flow. Uh, however, if it's specifically for a speaker, we are happy to do that. Could we have the next slide, please? So, um, as you know, uh, the Longitude Prize um, is addressing antimicrobial resistance. And, um, uh, but with the situation on COVID-19, uh, we had a discussion um, uh, what we would be uh, doing around this and how, of course, as everyone else, uh, how um, the situation is affecting us um, and the price. And um, the Longitude Prize team at Nesta has uh, contacted um, the registered, uh, 54 registered Longitude Prize teams who are working on, uh, on tests uh, for AMR um, and have identified 12 who are actually working um, on COVID-19 currently. So identifying the virus, uh, but also detecting antibodies, uh, which may be a sign of immunity. As you all know, this is um, uh, the theme of the hour. So. Uh, what we all would like to have. So um, we thought um, that would be an interesting um, opportunity to uh, tie in the expertise of uh, those teams and the uh, interest um, and technologies and expertise they have uh, in the current COVID-19 um, situation. And this was discussed at the Longitude Prize Advisory Panel and the judges and the Nesta team then uh, suggested that we all came up with this uh, webinar today. And um, I'm really, really pleased. We have uh, all of, around about 100 uh, people joining us today. So it's a fairly large group uh, for the short notice uh, which we had. So just a brief reminder um, of the uh, Longitude Prize uh, uh, criteria. And um, if you look at them again, uh, we are all sure you, you're very familiar with them. Needed, accurate, affordable, rapid, easy to use, scalable, uh, safe, and connected. All these criteria actually apply also uh, to tests which we would like to have for COVID-19. So there's a, a big similarity um, in requirements, uh, but of course there are specifics uh, for COVID-19 and uh, the aim of this webinar really is to open up this discussion uh, by, between the Longitude Prize teams, between you as uh, participants, and uh, see where we can harness uh, the expertise in the field uh, on AMR diagnostics um, towards uh, achieving something uh, for COVID-19. Could I have the next slide, please? Of course, nothing is achievable without funding. Um, 
again, I'm sure you're well aware that there is a, a rising opportunity uh, and, uh, around uh, receiving funding in this field. Um, there are uh, three calls which are here listed um, in the moment uh, or at the time when we put together the slides and the Longitude Prize put together these slides. Um, this is a, a rapidly evolving um, situation and in order to keep track with this, um, you should be uh, revisiting or visiting the uh, uh, the Longitude Prize website. Uh, you see the link uh, here. If you go on the usual Longitude Prize website, there is a COVID-19 section and it will be um, uh, highlighting the funding opportunities there. Okay, so I think with this, we could go to the next slide and we are already at this um, at the stage where we are inviting um, the presentations. And um, to start with, I would like to ask uh, Joe Fitchett, um, who's a medical director um, of uh, Mologic to give his presentation on COVID-19 diagnostics. Joe, over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to present a bit of work about our COVID-19 diagnostics that we started uh, really in earnest in end of February, early March. And now we're coming to the end of April. It would be great to share a few updates as to where we are, um, how we got here and where we're going next. If we could turn to the next slide, please. Just want to start up front with the acknowledgements. When we con conceptualized this program in January, at the time of the public health emergency, we had anticipated our colleagues in Malaysia and China would be the busiest. We had anticipated that these diagnostics, if we could develop them quick enough and, and high performance enough, would be validated there, would rely on samples there, and we would then turn to other settings, for example, Institut Pasteur de Dakar in Senegal or even in Europe, for a different background prevalence and a completely different scenario. However, as we all know, the world has changed so much in the last few hundred days, and we are now in Europe, shifted to North America, and the fourth wave, of course, is in Africa. And so this network has been invaluable in shaping the target product profile that we have been working towards, uh, partly due to a great absence of a TPP for COVID diagnostics, nearly three months on from the declaration of a public health emergency. On the next slide, I just want to show an image of the rapid iterative process that we deployed. So thanks to partnership with Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and St George's University of London, we prepared twice weekly validations in two sites over the last four weeks. And that has allowed us to go from 50 prototypes down to the chosen one for professional use and you see a standard housing here. And what it taught us was two things. One, we need a self-test format, even if it's a professional use kit, even though this one does look and will perform very well. It gives us more flexibility on the lines where we can include IgA, IgM, and IgG, the latter we consider being most important. But the self-test format really allows that IgG line to be interpreted more readily. Inside this image, you see four rapid tests in two different colors, a white and in a, um, a more yellowy colored device. And this here is an eco-appropriate material that we're also working on, which is PVA, polyvinyl alcohol, and that is water soluble. And so the kits on the right are ideally the kits that we will be deploying for professional use. And the importance of that, of course, is that if COVID-19 is here to stay, which we believe it is, we need to ensure that we are not doing harm in a different way in our in our healthcare response. So we are very conscious about ensuring that the eco-appropriate materials, at least on the housings on the outside, are covered from that perspective. On the next slide, the evolution since early April has been uh, the performance of an ELISA, which we have validated on 708 samples, 146 confirmed positives, by real-time PCR, ranging from day zero to 34, and we do have symptoms as well on a, on a major subset of those, and 564 negative samples, which I'll show you on the next slide. And it's, uh, if I could go back one slide just quickly. Uh, the performance here on the specificity is 97%, and 
the six false positives we have from the slide I'll show you in just a moment are uh, on virus panels that are that have very different pre clinical presentation to COVID-19. And so we believe that the specificity drop that we see here um, fits well within the urgent need that we have as a response and is a good first generation product. The sensitivity from day zero to 34, we believe is actually very strong um, because we wouldn't necessarily expect to have high levels of antibody so early on. And what we see is post lab diagnosis over eight days, that's 96% uh, reaching that magic 98%, which was in the original specification from MHRA. Um, on the next slide, what I think we've done is publish openly, and the paper's coming out tomorrow, uh, one of the fuller sets of a specificity panel, including multiple different types of coronavirus where we've tested on over 40, and we of course have paraflu and influenza. And this is extremely important as we all know because of the um, upcoming flu season, which we anticipate will start of course at the end of this year and may result in a double burden uh, for the health system. But what we see is a very reassuring specificity profile. And on the next slide, we'll show you that we are working hard to look at peptide arrays and see if we can remove some of the uh, specificity, the low spec the low cross reactivity to some of these coronavirus. Um, hopefully the next slide will show you that uh, with a visual of some of the peptides that we are including in the next generation ELISA. It may have been removed for this presentation. Ah, there it is. So here is just an example that we've done looking at nuclear protein, but we've done the same for the spike protein um, for the different antibodies. And this allows us to go even more um, into depth into how we deploy our ELISA, but most importantly, there's one message I want to get across today is R&D, research and development, really is pointless without M&A, manufacturing and access. And we've all seen the supply chain issues with the significant demand that has put us all under pressure. And being able to integrate a peptide ELISA will help us get around many of those supply chain issues. Thank you very much. So shall I just carry straight on, Till? As far as I know, I have no direct questions. So let me just double check. That's correct. So please, Fiona, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for giving me this chance to speak as well. We're not quite as far ahead as Melogic in terms of the development of the assay and, and, and you know, um, the challenge of getting materials has been a, a, has been one of the biggest issues that we have seen when we've been trying to develop the assay. Um, but just as a bit of background, um, we are um, developing currently a point of care platform, and we obviously have been focusing in on a specific biomarker for AMR. Um, we that technology um, we recognised could be utilised, obviously, for detection of either viral COVID-19 or IgG as a serological assay. So if you just go to the next slide, please. So the technology that we have was originally de developed at the National Physical Laboratory, and it's, it's a, it is a fast, um, quantitative and accurate technology. And, and we are currently working on two formats of the assay. We've started with the IgG assay first um, because we see the importance of that moving forward as restrictions are starting to lift and being able to screen quickly to see if those people that have potentially isolated with COVID-19 samples have actually had COVID-19. So we're specifically focusing in on the IgG to start with and then we are also looking at a, a viral um, detection system for saliva. The um, IgG format is in a finger stick format, so um, easy to use, um, um, less than 15 minutes, um, and can be done in doctor surgeries or, or um, nursing stations or field hospitals. Um, it isn't designed to be used in-house or it could potentially be used in pharmacies though. So the point of care system that we have is not going to have an industrial prototype available until the end of the year, but we have a lab-based system that we've been using for the last five, six years that was originally developed by the National Physical Laboratory and has had over 20 plus assays developed on it with good correlation to clinical samples. So we were trying to think innovatively around how we could use that system in the first instance while we were transitioning onto the point of care 
the system doesn't need to be used in a clinical laboratory and it doesn't need to be used in a, um, a um, registered laboratory um, and it just uses standard um, clinical um, accessories such as lancets and capillaries. So we thought there's, a, there's a, a chance here for us to scale up very quickly a straightforward reader um, with some software that runs off a small laptop and have a sensor that um, could effectively run an assay in um, three minutes for the, for the um, electrochemistry, five or six minutes incubation time. So you could quite quickly run through and screen um, people very quickly. So um, we're at an earlier stage. We, we literally have just started the um, development of this assay um, and we are managing to get clinical samples from various different partners. We're working with a partner in Uppsala University who has been collecting COVID-19 patient samples for the detection of HNL um, as well, because it's one of the, the issues with the um, uh, COVID-19 is secondary bacterial infections. So, but also so that we can ha um, detect IgG levels of COVID-19 in these samples too. We've been working closely with Imperial and King's College um, to, to try to set up, um, to get ourselves placed to set up clinical validation. And we have a, a, a slot with DSTL for doing the viral, a contrived viral study for us um, in, in their class three labs as well. Um, so the, the beauty of the system as well is that we can develop quite quickly within three to four weeks an assay on our system. Um, if you move to the next slide and I can show you a visual of the system. So the, on, the right hand, on the left hand side, what you can see here is our, our um, it's essentially a, a potentiostat. Um, it's an electrochemistry assay that uses a silver and a magnetic particle. And you can see you can run three assays at one go and you get a fully, for, for the um, viral detection, it would be a fully quantitative result. For the IgG, it's a quasi-quantitative result. Um, so the, the thought is that we could roll this system out very quickly with minimal training in doctor surgeries um, with a view that we would move it onto the point of care system at the end of the year. And you can see on the right hand side here is a, an industrial design for our point of care system that will be available at the end of the year. So that would be a cartridge based system, which would mean you just take the sample, put it straight into the cartridge and effectively the reader does all the rest and displays the results on the, on the touch screen. Um, so we've got an implementation plan in place where we are currently developing the assay, which we believe will take around four weeks. Um, we've got a verification um, in place and we're starting to look at how we can get that clinical validation in place. And alongside that, we're looking at how we scale up chemistry. We're already speaking to our electrode sensor manufacturers around scale up. And we have two partners there, one in Scotland and one in the Isle of Wight. And we're working with a local manufacturer reader to uh, local to Bedfordshire. So we've got everything in play to scale up. We just need to get through the next four weeks in terms of the clinical validation. Um, the impact, like I said, that we're seeing with the COVID-19, I mean, we're a small team. Um, and we've still got the team working in the lab with social distancing. The biggest issue is getting hold of the raw materials and, and you know, everybody's going from a standing start and trying to scale up and, and that will be the issue moving forward. But it's not just the raw materials for doing the assays, it's other raw materials for making the kits, such as the lancets and capillaries, etc. because they're being used everywhere at the moment. So, um, so we, we believe our solution could be quick and easy to use with minimal training and, as I say, transition to the point of care to make it even easier to use later in the year. We, we, we believe that moving forward, we are going to have to continue to still test for COVID-19 um, and at the IgG tests are going to be really important as lockdown starts to um, be de decreased in terms of uh, monitoring people and, and getting a real spread for the virus. Thank you. That's everything I had to say. Well, thank you, Fiona, uh, for such a wonderful presentation. Thanks to the Longitude Prize for arranging this much needed webinar. Uh, so myself, I'm Sachin Dubey, and I'm representing a startup called Model Innovations and coming from Pune in India. Uh, so at the Longitude Prize, uh, entry we were working on 
quick identification of urinary tract infection pathogens, essentially trying to miniaturize the detection of pathogen in urine by making a credit card size device. And essentially, we thought that this platform has the capacity to be extended on the COVID uh, tests that are being developed. So we uh, started our journey in making the COVID much later compared to all the other com companies out there. So at the end of uh, March, we realized that, yes, there's a need in India specifically to create such kind of uh, testing devices because the testing rates have been much slower. And because of that, uh, the number of cases are being on the rise. So uh, that's how uh, we decided to start working on uh, the COVID test that is being developed. So coming towards the next slide, please. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, nothing much to be said about the gravity of the problem. Uh, it's, it has grappled and become a pandemic throughout the globe, not not sparing any country in the world. And uh, in India, uh, we've been in the lockdown from the 25th of March. And as, as we can see, the latest data that comes from uh, today, uh, that the cases have been on the rise, uh, the United States being the worst affected. And uh, again, UK has like one black 33,000 cases. The cases in India as well are rising. So we were under the anticipation that the cases are uh, somehow going down, but as the testing capacity is being increased, the number of cases are starting to increase. And the only way that we can have a containment or a break on the further enhancement is doing a lot of tests. Well, uh, the antibody tests have started to pick up and we again are also developing uh, antibody based tests that detect the IgG and IgM antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. But essentially, the chemistry that we have developed allows us to, you know, take the detection limits much lower. So that's uh, that's the whole idea of, you know, enhancing our capabilities to detect the uh, infection earlier when the uh, antibodies concentrations are much lower. So based on the understanding of our early product at uh, uh, for UTIs, we were able to go up to picogram uh, level, limits of detection for uh, the antibodies. So uh, that's that's how we are trying to extend uh, our chemistries and uh, the novel nanostructures that we've created to you know take the limits of detection to much lower levels. So uh, we are developing this product called as NCOV Sense. It's into early stages of development and we are working with the Indian Council of Medical Research to do the validations uh, somehow, which are expected uh, to begin by the third week of May. Uh, this has been supported by the Department of Science and Technology uh, by the Government of India. Uh, but uh, as as we are going ahead in this journey, a lot of a lot of things, uh, the barriers and the challenges that are coming up have been realized. Uh, so over to the next slide, please. Uh, the uh, everybody knows now that the time is of essence. So, there are a lot of people started to develop the tests, many tests which uh, got uh, approved for testing without a lot of validation. So, essentially, these kind of problems have started to emerge now. The sensitivity and specificity of many of the tests, which were uh, procured by a lot of uh, countries around the globe, have been extremely low and dwindling. So again, the question comes that, is there a problem with the quality of the tests or is there a problem with the strain that have traveled to different parts of the world? Uh, again, a cross reactivity to other coronaviruses is one issue that we really feel we'll need to work upon uh, as uh, we move ahead in the validation. So uh, because of the limited sample size and the limited sample testing that we are able to do, we do not get a lot of uh, samples who have infections co-infections of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 and the other coronaviruses. So absolutely getting those numbers is uh, really tricky. I've been hearing a lot about the immunity passport thing that uh, uh, the antibody tests have been hyped so much for, you know, ascertaining somebody who has been, you know, uh, forgiven with this, uh, that uh, they can start to work again. They can, you know, uh, uh, remove the social distancing and things like that. So again, uh, we are still not able to detect the neutralizing antibodies. So again, I feel this is a challenge. 
now what has happened that uh, with the problem of the antibody tests performance in uh, many countries and recently in india uh, it was reported that uh, the kits that india procured had only 5% accuracy so uh, this has uh, led to an immense loss in confidence with the government and the medical agencies about the antibody test and uh, incidentally the indian council of medical research has put a ban for like 2 to 3 days of testing uh the patient with these antibody tests as highlighted by uh, fiona and uh, others that the shortage and unavailability of the reagents is rampant and because the whole world the globe is under lockdown so the logistics is again becoming a problem so how do we you know sir uh, circumvent this kind of situation is again tricky one uh, one last point that i want to raise that this is a global problem and everybody needs to work together so just a food for thought that can companies and institutions around the globe come together and make a universal kit that performs the same way as it perform in their home countries so that's that's uh, something i uh, maybe it could be a take away from this webinar that people should come together work uh, in cooperation and so one thing probably like somebody making a kit in uk wants to validate that kit in indian population or vice versa this collaboration could actually allow that to happen so that the test is validated on a much wider audience and uh, patient size so that's that's about it so uh, thank you very much uh, the last slide is a thank you slide and thank you so much for your patience open to any questions steven uh, steve if you uh would be okay. I would like to interrupt here for a second because there are um, uh, there's a flurry of um, uh, questions coming in, which I'm trying to catch up with. Um, there are. Uh, let me just start with one, and this is going basically to all um, uh, presenters, um, which is about the sample. And uh, if you could maybe make a comment on um, which samples you are. Uh, respectively using for your uh, respective essays and maybe say something about the challenges you foresee with um, obtaining the sample, variability, uh, etc. So maybe uh, we go from, start with Sachin as you just have spoken, but we go to um, uh, backwards to the other presenters as well. Uh, so we're using uh, blood, blood as a sample and uh, because of the uh, ease of procuring blood through a small lancet. So diabetes tests have made the procurement of blood really simple. So it's a two drop test and we are going for the blood sample right now. Um, in ours, we've got, we've got um, for the IgG, it's, it's finger stick blood. We feel that that is the easiest when you're trying to do screen, large screening in a short, uh, quickly. Um, the saliva is what we're using for the viral. We had tried to think about finger stick for that, but the viremia level in blood is very low, I believe. So that's why we've stuck with saliva. It's slightly less invasal, invasive than nasal. And for Melogic, the ELISA, of course, is serum. Uh, and I should have mentioned that CE marked tomorrow. The rapid test is three microliters of whole blood serum or plasma. And the antigen test, which we hope will be available from June, is also saliva or gingivocurricular fluid. In, thank you very much. In your respective experiences, um, um, there is a discussion going on uh, about the uh, levels um, uh, of detection uh, required in uh, saliva versus nasopharyngeal swab. Have you looked into those as well? Because usually you would go for nasopharyngeal swaps. Yeah, we, we haven't as yet. Um, it's part of the work that we're going to do with our contrived clinical study, but we haven't as yet. We, we're, at Melogic, we're looking at both. And of course, the best one will be picked, but we hope saliva will work best because, as Fiona mentioned, it's less invasive and it offers a lot of flexibility. We are also looking at plasma with our IgG assay as well, but I think that it's easier to collect a finger stick of blood and, and do it from that perspective. But, um, you know, pl plasma is readily available as patient samples at the moment for testing. So we're, we're looking at both. 
um, it was in your presentations, um, uh, but there were some questions about um, to all antibody-based device developers if they could comment on how early post-exposure or post-diagnosis antibodies start to rise and what's the kinetics um, for IgM, IgG response uh, from your early clinical studies. Do you want anyone in particular to answer? Yeah, no, it's all, it was addressed to all antibody-based device developers. So um, all of you did that. So maybe if you want to, if you want to go first. So um, obviously IgM is the first response and generally comes sort of three to five days, peaking around seven to 10 days. Um, sort of IgG comes sort of um, after that and peaks sort of 14 days. But what we're seeing is post 28 days gives a more accurate result. Yeah, so I agree with uh, Fiona, but uh, essentially what we are trying to do is like when the response just starts to elicit the minimum number of the antibodies that are present, which in many cases in rapid tests go beyond detection, our aim is to detect at those minimum levels. So th that's the whole uh, idea of capitalizing from the usense technology to this COVID test so that right at the onset, uh, we don't have to wait for the fifth or the sixth day for the IgMs to uh, peak at the levels. When the onset has just begun, uh, we the whole aim is to try to detect them at those those levels. And for us, we've really been amazed by what an unpredictable virus this has been. The antibody kinetics are um, not like SARS, from my experience. We see a really uh, interesting but unique profile with the immunoglobulin A which seems to be the first marker, but also might indicate a secondary bacterial infection later in patients who are unwell in the intensive care or uh, deterioration. We're looking at what that might mean at the moment. The IgM uh, is detectable, uh, but doesn't offer from our assay as much early warning as we would have anticipated compared to other viruses. And then similarly to the other groups, the IgG, uh, seems to be A, the most reliable, but B, we have seen it consistently present um, uh, before, even before 14 days, both from onset of symptoms and from laboratory confirmation. But there's a subgroup which seems to not generate IgG responses until very late, despite having had confirmed infection on nucleic acid testing. So we'll be publishing certainly our data openly and we hope others will be able to pull this information together because I think there's so much we can learn together on this and we expect that those dynamics will have a very different profile with different age groups and different community versus urban settings. Thank you very much. Um, let's uh, stop here for uh, for the discussion for, for a moment and uh, uh, move to Steve, um, who is impatiently, I guess, or patiently, patiently waiting uh, for his presentation. Uh, let's hear from Steve and come back to Q and A. I see there are more questions coming in, and I'm sure we'll have more good discussions. Uh, Steve, over to you, please. Um, no, it's a really, really interesting discussion, and I'm very pleased to be able to listen into it. Um, so we've put quite a bit of guidance on our website, um, and. We want, well, I think we're probably the first ones to have put together a TPP for um, some serology tests. Um, which I, I just want to give a quick background on the next slide. So most of you will, will know um, that uh, for Europe and um, UK still in the, at the moment during this transition period, we are regulating to the IVD directive, which requires all products to have a CE mark. And then click on please. And again, oh, no, go back, please, sorry. So that, that was meant to highlight the 100% there. So what, what the CE marking means is we want people to, to, to be very clear about their, the performance of their assay um, in the labeling and in the instructions for use and have all the evidence to support that. So go on, please. So we, we this is what you've seen on our website at the moment. This is version one, um, a specification for OCT and self-test serology. Um, we haven't yet uh, looked at any PCR specifications, and we haven't yet looked at ELISA specifications, but they're all 
in the thinking. Um, I had hoped that by now we'd have um, our version two on online. Um, that hasn't happened yet. So you're getting a, a very advanced view. Um, next, please. So this this is this is your um, early view of our uh, one or two of you on the on the call have, have already seen it and contributed to it. Thank you very much for that. Um, but this this is what we are hoping to publish probably tomorrow now. And it's, it's changed in that it's not a specification anymore, it's a target product profile. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with TPPs. So it's not the bar that you have to meet, it's kind of the, uh, the way where you're aiming to get to. And again, we, we, we are talking now about um, antibody tests to help determine immunity. And of course, the science around what we're detecting in these, in these, in these um, tests and protective immunity, long-term protective immunity is just not there. So we, we absolutely recognize that we're writing this target product profile in the absence of a lot of science, a lot of information, but it's the best that we've got at the moment. Which also means that we are gonna be moving on, I think quite quickly to version three as the science um, evolves and as our understanding um, evolves, we will probably move on to version three fairly soon. And what I'm, what I'm hoping to do is uh, find um, a, a group, existing group if I can, or otherwise I'll set, set up a new one to be an expert panel to advise us on what this um, target, what version three of the target product profile should look like. And I think then, then we'll get a, a, a it'll, it'll be a lot more robust document um, with a lot more science in it and, and, and references across to some of the work that you've, you, the earlier speakers have already been um, talked about. Next slide, please. So this is what it said in version one, um, and you can see that you can you know you can you can shoot holes through some of that, um, and you can say that, that it's it's there's a, there's a lot wrong with that, and I, I would I would I would agree with you. We wanted to get the target we wanted, we wanted to get the specification out very quickly, and we did, um, and and now we're working on improving it. So if you click on please, so that's what it looks like now. And you can see, I think this is a, a little bit more robust scientifically and statistically. Still very high specification for sensitivity, still very high specification for, for, sens for specificity. But we now have 95% um, uh, confidence, confidence intervals are, are clearer, and the number of samples that you need to use are clearer. Um, the challenges on this one, I think, are um, getting that, it, it's probably around sensitivity. Uh, I think specificity, we, we are unlikely to move on. Um, if we do move, it'll go up to 99%. It certainly won't come down. Um, specificity is absolutely critical to patient safety and absolutely critical to, to, to virus transmission. Um, and and there, there are plenty of negative samples around, I think, um, from, from well before, pre-pandemic pre -pandem, pre samples um, are available uh, to, to a lot of people. On the sensitivity, I, you know, I, I don't know if 98% is... is, is, is it's absolutely the right number, and if it's going to stay um, as that number, um, we need we need to get some more facts and some more information. It has you know it hasn't changed from version one to version two because we haven't had any evidence to support a change. Um, but maybe there's some evidence to support change to sensitivity for version three. And then of course getting 200 confirmed positive cases, um, and, and, and we, we probably need to um, expand on that about how many days. Um, convalescent and whether you need to be um, accessing serial conversion panels. I think that's, that's going to be a lot more complex to, 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 to um, put together in, in version three of the specification. Next slide, please. So uh, three steps to take. Um, if you have a product which you think is, is, is okay, I mean, of course, um, a lot of the I've already said that you're CE marking products right now, and that's fantastic. The target product profile is not for CE marking. It's not a regulatory hurdle. It's there to, um, uh, to help decide which tests will support the UK testing strategy. Um, so assess your test against the TPP, uh, and, and that's where you'll find it on that link. Um, if you meet the TPP, or if you are almost there and look quite promising, you will need to go through a process with the Department of Health and Social Care, uh, and that's a short survey just to find out uh, what kind of test it is, who you are, and whether you're likely to be meeting the specification. Um, so that's a, we, we're using that as a triage process. So if you're successful at triage, and you usually get quite a quick response, um, but you're not yet CE marked, then we, we will consider derogations. 
At the moment, we're prioritizing derogations for things which are successful at triage. So if you, if you haven't been through the triage process, if you haven't been successful, we won't be able to consider your derogation. But if you have been successful, we will be able to fast track your derogation through. And we're looking at two to three days um, if possible. Next slide, please. So that, that's, that's just our process. Um, the, 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 the websites that I'm uh, uh, directing you to are need updating. Uh, and again, they, they were to be updated today, but I think they'll be updated tomorrow um, to, to, to make it a little bit clearer about what, what is needed. Um, but we do have a fast track process. And next slide, please. So I've already mentioned that we're going to go to version three and it's probably going to be um, a version four. I don't know how many versions there are going to be until we, until we get this absolutely clear because the science continues to emerge. We are um, looking at whether we need to do a TPP for um, ELISA. Um, and, and clearly, the, just, just hearing the different kinds of tests that um, the previous speakers are talking about, we're going to need to get those specifications, the, the, the TPP focused towards different sample types uh, and, and include perhaps what, what is the role of um, IgM in immunity screening? Um, so we, we, we're going to have. A, I think we'll. Ha I think we'll have a, speci a specification for Eliza's next, um, possibly a version three. I don't know. I can't promise that. And of course, as I mentioned, I think the, the, the process for getting a derogation through that triage, through a DHSC survey, um, is a, is a bit tough for um, a lot of manufacturers. Um, if you have an Eliza test and you go through that that um, triage process, you'll be kicked out because it doesn't, folk, um, doesn't cater for ELISA tests at the moment. Um, so we, we, we need to improve that and make that a bit clearer. And then I think the final thing that we, we need to do is we need to find out from test developers, uh, um, from yourselves, what it is you want uh, and how can we help you. And I think particularly in some of the, some of the um, access to raw materials, access to uh, sample banks, access to um, sample panels, um, these are the things, that, and, and also um, access to EQA or proficiency testing schemes. These are all things which we, we, we know are really, really important, and we're doing everything we can to try and um, kind of collate all of that, and working with the, the, um, uh, the rest of the um, UK government to try and make sure that you've got access to all of those um, sample panels and serial conversion panels, control materials, and EQA and PT. So I think that's it from me, Till, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, this was excellent, and I'm sure um, we will have loads of questions. Um, this is very, very interesting for the developers. Um, before we go to the questions, I, uh, I have one um, directly. So uh, with regards to the TPP, you said you will have several versions um, which you will put up, and uh, you said something about an expert panel. Are you going to um, give a um, an opportunity for people to comment? Will you publish previous versions and have your rounds of contributions there, like, like FIND or WHO were doing? Um, I haven't considered it, but um, we, we, we do get a lot of feedback anyway um, it, on, 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 on version one, um, so that, and that's just come through social media. So it, it, it makes sense for us to have some kind of consultation process. Um, but I, th I think, I don't think that's, that hasn't happened for version two. I don't think we'll have an open consultation for version three because I don't think we'll be able to, to, to get that set up in time. But it's definitely something we can think about for version four. Okay, um, there was a question, thank you. There was a question uh, if the UK was following the EU medical device directive for IVDs in this process. Yes, so um, in this transition period, and this is the, the Brexit question, obviously, um, you know, the, the UK left the EU um, earlier on in the year, but during this tra transition period until the end of this year, then we continue to, to, to um, uh, work towards uh, existing IVD directive 9879. So for any developments which will be beyond this year, um, what would you advise to them? Uh, Keep keep looking out for what happens for um, when we when we um okay. when the transition period ends. All right. Um, just looking at the uh, so there was a question um, which I saw previously. Um, maybe that's to all um, uh, the presenters. Uh, which type of materials would be better to use uh, for for using? I just read it for using peptides in place of viral particles. What kind of peptides are better? Those produced synthetically or 
recombinant approaches. So uh, I think that's uh, in, in part a, or that's in, in under the big question of availability of reagents to develop a test, to build a test, and uh, also to test the uh, sensitivity specificity. Um, where do we get the materials from? And um, and Joe said something about the, uh, uh, it wasn't quite clear to me, uh, where the peptides were used. So you use peptide um, instead of antibodies, as far as I understood. Yes, yeah, so at the moment we have um, recombinant whole protein for nuclear protein and also uh, recombinant for spike, spike two. And we have, and that, that is part of the CE marked ELISA. And we deploy the same antigens in the lateral flow so they're linked. But we have in parallel, which is not ready yet, but is getting their uh, peptides for those antigens, which allows us to boost the specificity. As Steve said, so important to get the specificity right. And that's why we looked at the specificity on as many samples as we could, so that we could also document where it falls down. And at, at the moment, just to add some color to those false positives, the enterovirus was uh, among a newborn child. So it wouldn't necessarily have been the clinical presentation suggestive of COVID-19. So it gives you a sense of what, where we're trying to do everything we can to boost the specificity and some other targets like the receptor binding domain could help there as well. Okay, and uh, thank you very much. There was a, a summer question about the antibodies. Um, um, so is there any, um, so what, what do people prefer? Is it um, monoclonal, polyclonal, or are there other alternatives to using antibodies? Uh, if you want to have an antigen test. So from a logics perspective, we're, we're looking at uh, antibodies, uh, of course, and we're looking at very many different species for the antibody generation because each one might recognize a not normally recognized epitope in NNR. And chicken is one example that we've seen, for example, in schistosomiasis work very well, but llama works very well for TB, TB lamb. So we're looking to deploy that same kind of approach for COVID-19. However, we can also engineer those fragments to be uh, novel molecular binding entities, and we will plan to do that. The problem is these are all second generation technologies. So we'll we're doing what we can on the first generation so that it meets or exceeds these specifications that Steve has outlined, but it wouldn't prevent or stop a second generation product from being deployed. And it's so important we do that, of course, if this is here to stay. From, from our perspective, we've been using monoclonal and polyclonal, but we have some chimeric antibodies as well that we've been having a look at, but um, we haven't got much detail on those yet. Yeah, so the same, same from the perspective module, we are right now focusing on monoclonals and again some, some chimeric uh, antibodies as well. But eventually the plan uh, as we proceed ahead is the second version is to diagnose the uh, viral viruses directly uh, from the nasal swab. So that's uh, version two of uh, what the product will be. But right now it's this is how it is. It's a really active discussion in the, thank you Sachin, a, a really active discussion in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, I'm trying to pick up uh, questions, please state them again if, uh, if something is getting missed. Um, I see one thing uh, which came up is if there are ana other analytes um, uh, which uh, people see, uh, which may come up. So antibody uh, serology, antigen and viral PCR. Um, so for example, can you uh, monitor also inflammatory responses to assist clinicians at the point of care. Do our, do our speakers have a view on this? So other markers to monitor during COVID to help clinicians? So, I mean, obviously I touched on that in ours because we've been looking at a biomarker for bacterial infection that's expressed during bacterial infection and, 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 and I built, you know, 
probably one of the secondary problems with the COVID-19 is bacterial pneumonia and other bacterial problems. So um, having a marker like that in, for testing as well could potentially help um, determine um, subsequent bacterial infection. Um, there are other biomarkers as well, like PCT and, and um, uh, CRP that could potentially be used as inflammatory markers as well. But it comes back to, to um, with those particular markers, you know, that they're raised during inflammation and you've obviously got an inflammatory issue with the COVID-19. Very much so, yes. Are there any other comments from um, our speakers uh, to these questions of other markers who might be useful to, to be detected or they know of? So I think I second with Fiona. Uh, recently uh, study at CMC Vellore in India Medical Hospital. Many of the patients admitted had uh, uh, like asymptomatic patients or those who even developed severe symptoms were tested for uh, CRP and PCT. So that's again, uh, like during the lack of uh, PCR system or rapid antibody tests, this, this was one kind of approach that was taken. Uh, so yeah, I, I think uh, that that could be one probability, but uh, given the chances of uh, being very specific uh, towards particularly SARS-CoV-2, these are more of a generalized markers rather than uh, a confirmatory. Maybe uh, quickly the, the discussion um, moving to molecular. Um, there were a few questions, some of them were addressed, but the maybe a quick comment from from the speakers on the situation, they, how they see it uh, regarding um, molecular tests, so viral RNA, uh, there was a question on LAMP um, and other PCRs. So uh, do you have a view on this? Uh, obviously there's a lot of activity going on and uh, from my perspective, it's always, uh, we're facing um, with COVID the very similar problems of uh, rapid molecular diagnostics um, at point of care as in any other situation. So, is it is it easier? Is it more difficult? What do you what do you see uh, happening in the field you're aware of? Whoever wants to go first, Sachin, you're just <laughs> I see you. So I, I think uh, these would continue to be the uh, you know major stakeholders in doing confirmatory tests until and unless we develop a rapid test which is directly detecting the virus. So uh, till the, till that moment, I still uh, believe that uh, molecular tests will be uh, going to rule the confirmatory kind of uh, assessment. Uh, there are again like. Uh, lamb based and NAT based systems being developed. Some of uh, them have undergone trials at India as well. So I see these systems coming up and picking up. Uh, and again, uh, like uh, reducing the time is what everybody is focusing on. So these gradually, I think uh, the uh, shift is happening to lamb and uh, NAT based as, as well. Yeah, I, I agree. Just adding to that, I mean, the, the goal ultimately is to get a desktop PCR, isn't it? Rather than have to send the samples back to the lab, that would be ideal. But there are challenges with taking molecular testing into the field around contamination, etc. So, um, I, you know, but PCR is is the gold standard for for con confirmatory at the moment while we're developing these assays. Uh, if there are no further comments on this, I, I have another uh, question, which is probably for Steve, but there, any, anyone else, uh, please go ahead and, and respond to that. So uh, what the plans are, you're aware of uh, national and international plans um, to collaborate with manufacturers of vaccines um, to detect the um, positive immunity after vaccination. Um. I haven't considered that, but actually, uh, because MHRA is a, 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 a dual authority, we have um, um, the vaccine. Um, the vaccine is a medicine. We have the medicines regulators uh, in the same, well, not in the same building anymore because we, we're all working from home, but in the same organisation as the devices regulators. And I think there's a there's ample opportunity for us to uh, to make sure that we uh, we collaborate on on things like that. And I am talking to our medicines colleagues on a at least weekly basis.
Till, can I um, yes. address the, the stats questions? Okay, been, please. Been, obviously, obviously, we're getting some some questions and some and some negative feedback around around the stats. Okay. Um, we we are getting we are getting some now for version two some very high level um, stats advice um, from UK from um, UK and international experts um, and and uh, I, I'm 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 happy with the stats that we've got in there. I'm happy with the confidence intervals that we've got in there. Obviously, as as as, as we get to version three, we will continue to to improve that that those stats. Okay, um, there is, uh, again, I, I think I saw this somewhere, um, uh, in, your, in, in the trials when you test for, uh, for antibody presence, would you not need to include, or is this planned, I, I'm not sure if I've seen this, um, uh, asymptomatic um, patients or non-patients, individuals? How do, you, how do you test for people who don't have symptoms? How do you find them? How do you enroll them in your study? Well, I think that's that's a challenge, and that's where the random uh, sampling would come into play. Uh, again, uh, even for the uh, normal symptomatic patients, it's difficult to get the sample. So, uh, ba back here in India, I think uh, it's it's uh, doing a large set of uh, sample trials is a challenge. Uh, people are skeptical of getting themselves tested, uh, believing that if uh, the tests comes out to be positive, they would be taken. Uh, in a quarantine so yeah asymptomatic again is a challenge but uh, that's that's where i think uh, the uh, collaborative work of uh, companies and the government agencies will come into play that uh, when they are starting to do a random sampling they can take up the tests which are accepted by the uh, medical associations to be tested on those uh, on those uh, samples and those patients that's how, that's how i think this this asymptomatic thing could be taken care of Any other comments to this from the floor? With regards to um, um, specificity um, and, and the asymptomatic and the um, yeah, maybe uh, fo focused on that. Um, the specificity uh, with regards to the common cold coronaviruses. Are, uh, is obviously something which uh, for the PCR tests, but also for the antibody tests uh, should be of a very high priority. Again, uh, where do you plan or do you, where, where is the source of um, a samples to test this? Um, maybe uh, Steve could um, comment on this, on, on sample availability to test specificity. You said something that uh, panels will be made available, but um, is this on the website? Um, you mentioned you showed the website of the MHRA, or are there other sources where people can get these um, samples? Thank you, Till. So it's it's not an MHRA responsibility to to, to um, uh, provide samples. Uh, we we don't have that competence or capacity to do that. Um, uh, although having said that, um, uh, NIBSC, which is the National Institute for Biological Standards and Controls, um, is part of the um, broader uh, MHRA organization. Um, I believe they've got some PCR control material and I think they're working on some serology control materials and obviously you know they, they, they work with WHO to, to develop international standards so that's some way off yet but I'm, but I'm, but I'm sure they're, they're working on towards that. I've been told by somebody um, that they have a, um, a sample bank of 200 very well characterized ethically um, uh, sourced um, negative samples and 200 very well characterized ethically sourced uh, positive samples um, across a range of, 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 um, of uh, um, stages of disease, um, uh, pro pro progressive disease in, in quite large volumes. Um, and what, what, what I've been working on today is um, thinking about how people can access um, information about those sample banks so that that becomes a resource that you can use in developing your products um, you know, we, 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 it's not an MHR respons responsibility to do that, but we really want to help you to develop tests which are, which are sufficiently robust. There are companies that offer um, these uh, um, blood, blood banking type 
companies that offer these samples. And, and we are also trying to work with the likes of Imperial in London, call, uh, King's College, um, so that, and as I said, with Professor Perbinger at Uppsala, so they are collecting samples for us as well with known status. Um, but there are private companies that offer, and I think I've seen recently a company called Serolite, which um, is based in the, in the US that has a panel of samples that they're offering around as well. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you, uh, Fiona, and thank you, Steve. Um, unfortunately, we need to wrap up. Uh, the time is up. Um, uh, I would like to thank um, all our speakers, um, uh, Fiona, Stephen, uh, Joe, and uh, Sachin, and um, uh, for their contributions and the lively discussion and responding to all the questions, um, the audience for asking so many questions and joining in. Um, and uh, of course, Nesta for organizing all this and uh, hosting today's um, uh, seminar and webinar. With that, I think uh, we are concluding the webinar. Again, um, thank you very much and uh, for sure see you next time. Yeah. Thank you.